today's session. And oh, I see we're now recording. So hi there, I'm Lynn Schofield Clark, and I am the moderator for today's session, which is titled Scholar and Industry Perspectives on Rights, Responsibilities, and Receptions of News by and for Youth. And uh, it's really nice to have a hybrid panel here that includes people who are scholars in this area, um, as well as those who are practitioners. And I wanna say a special thanks to Nancy Jennings for having the idea and putting this panel together. We really appreciate the opportunity to speak with one another and that this will be a recorded session so that people will be able to watch it later if they haven't been able to be here before. And I know the two people who joined us um, to participate and listen to the, the panel were our, um, Maria Jose Brits and, uh, and also um, Heidi Rosek Dahl, who are also people studying in this area. Maria Jose has launched a very large study uh, just recently in Portugal, uh, looking at youth and news in Portugal. And Heidi Rosek Dahl is a, a graduate student who's finishing up a PhD that's really Really fascinating about the studies of this area um, and looking at comprehensively at all the studies that have been done. So, so welcome to both of you as well, and um, and welcome to those who are watching us um, after the fact in Zoom. So, um, I am glad to be able to introduce you to our first speaker, who is Sagi Dinar, and the name of her talk is is uh, Newsers: The Duality Between Youth News Consumption Habits and Their Perceptions of the Credibility of News Platforms. So, Sagi, we'll turn it over to you. Yes, thank you. Uh, so I'll share my uh, presentation. Yeah, you can see it now. Great. Okay. Um, so hi, and thank you for uh, being here and inviting me. Um, I will speak about my PhD research, um, uh, which has been done in uh, Bar Ilan University uh, in Israel. Um, I am um, due to the time limits. I think I want to talk ab um, a lot about the theoretical framework, but um, uh, three uh, topics that uh, led me to the research was uh, news consumption in the digital era and um, the theoretical uh, framework and empirical knowledge that we have regarding news and its consumption in the uh, digital era by different audiences led me to the understanding of cross-media, of course, uh, cross-media consumption, as well as new opportunities for um, uh, to create news content for the uh, audiences. Regarding uh, youth news consumption, uh, majority of studies dealing with the uh, youth uh, news consumption examine how they um, uh, accommodate um, um, the news and needs of the consumers and how they, uh, the frequency in which they um, consume the news. And studies show that uh, youth are uh, intensive consumers of the internet and prefer uh, to consume news through uh, um, um, and information through the traditional media, not through the traditional media and the social media. Um, and regarding media credibility, um, I understood that um, most of research and recent studies uh, show that many news consumers uh, through social media um, express uh, distrust in social media and claim that uh, this is inaccurate news. Um, this is what led me to the aim of, um, of this research. Um, I wanted to study newsers, um, the new news consumers, the youth, the Israeli youth as new news consumers. And the goal of my research was to understand the world of the newsers in an environment characterized by mediatization, uh, which emphasizes the media preference and the media presence in, um, in the area of all social life. Um, my research question in this research was the, what are the different aspects of news consumption among uh, youth in Israel? I studied Jewish Israeli um, youth. And uh, for doing it, I used two methods. I uh, used in-depth interviews uh, with 36 youth in Israel, Israeli youth aged 15 to 18 from different background variables, of course. And I also used a nationwide survey among a representative sample of 673 young people in Israel, also aged 15 to 18, and they uh, study in 15 Israeli state and state religious um, high schools in Israel. Um, my main findings regarding news consumption uh, frequency, as you can see, I uh, found that we ha they have top uh, five 
um, uh, top platforms for youth news consumption when number one uh, is social media. Most of Israeli youth, um, um, more than 70% of Israeli youth uh, consume news through social media every day in their everyday lives. Um, Actually, number did you two, mean to show us slides, to change slides? Is that the idea? Sorry? I can only see your front page, sort of. You don't see my slides? No, I only see the first slide. Oh, really? Why is that? Oh. I don't know. Wait, I'll try again. Oh. I'll try again. Good that you told me. Uh, now you can see it? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, uh, so I talked about the research question. I talked about that two methods, the hybrid methods that I use. And it's good that you said it because we are here in the findings. Uh, so I found uh, top five, that the top five platforms for youth, Israel use news consumption are uh, number one, the social media. As I said, 70% of Israel youth use social media for news consumption in their everyday lives. Number two is YouTube. Number three, smartphone apps. Number four, search engines. And number five, television. They do use television. But the lowest frequency was found for consuming news through blogs, podcasts, print newspapers, and radio. They hardly consume news in Israel. The youth hardly consume news through those platforms. Uh, regarding the media credibility, and news trust, I asked the respondents to uh, rate the level of trust in news platforms from one, like not believing at all, to 10, full trust. And as we can see, the highest levels of trust were given to news on television, news on the radio, and news in print and newspapers. So although youth are digital natives, as uh, said uh, Mark Fransky a long time ago, their high perceptions of trust are attributed um, to traditional media, to veteran media. The high degree of trust is inversely related, as I see here, to the news consumption frequency through the traditional platforms other than TV. Um, and those, uh, um, those fund findings were also reinforced by some quotes from the in-depth uh, interviews like, we see here one of the interviewees said, I believe mostly in television because it combines images, reports, and narration that conveys credibility. Another one said, radio is the most reliable, perhaps because it feels the most authoritative. And the third one, I believe mostly in print newspapers, but because there are a lot of opinions there, I just, I, um, and not just technical facts, I compare several newspapers. Those findings, led me to some interesting conclusions. First of all, I uh, saw that my study revealed two very interesting, in my opinion, dualities among youth. While they hardly consume news through traditional media, such as printed newspapers or radio, they regard them as highly reliable. This is the first duality. And the second duality, although youth often consume news through TV satire programs, I found they like to watch TV satire programs, they attribute a low level of credibility to the satire programs. They like to consume news through them, but they don't believe them. And um, I claim that youth perceive traditional media as official. The perception leads them to attribute very high levels of authority and credibility to those news platforms and those traditional news platforms. And I also wanted to argue that newsers understand satire as a different genre from the general news, and they are able to discern it as unrealistic. They like to watch it, uh, they consume news through it, but they perceive it as less uh, truthworthy. Um, thank you very much for your attention. I did it at seven minutes. 
<laughs> Even with a little hiccup there <laughs> with the technology. Yeah. Thank you, Sagi. We really appreciate your presentation. And what we'll do is move to the next presentation so that we have time for everyone to speak. And then we'll have an opportunity for questions and conversation at the end. So our next paper is uh, by the joint group at Roskilde with Kim Christian Schroeder, Chris Peters, uh, and graduate students Josephine Lehaf and Julia Volpius. And the title of their paper is Becoming News Savvy, Investigating Young Adults' Information Repertoires from a Civic and Everyday Perspective. So I'll turn it over to you, Kim. Well, thank you. Um, I'm just trying to find my files here. Just a second, sorry. I don't know why I cannot seem to find it right now. Oh, there we are, sorry. I think that's the wrong window, Kim, because we're looking yeah, at- Yeah, but oh, I'm, okay. I'll, I'll try to get it out of this one here. Oh, no, that's okay. fine. I just didn't think you wanted us yeah. all to see your email. Well. Right. <laughs> okay. I'm just not one saying I'm getting fired or something. I'm Sorry. Fine <laughs> <laughs> Are you okay, all of you? Can you see this? Uh, we right can now see, we're, yeah. We, yeah, we still we see your, your email box. We see your email. We don't see the PowerPoint. So I think you have oh. to unshare and then share, then it should show up there and you'll be able to share again. And if you have sound, make sure you click the box that says share sound. Yeah. Not that we're not all experts on Zoom by now, but I know there's something oh. about being a presenter that when you're in that moment, it's like, oh my God, I forgot everything I knew about Zoom. <laughs> so it's okay. Do you see anything time. now? Do you see anything now? Nope. Mm -hmm. No. Ah, okay. Maybe uh, you can hear me, I guess. Uh, maybe I can just get Chris to come down to my room and help me with this. <laughs> and, uh, and then the next presenter could go sure. first. Sure. Yes, yeah, so is that all right? We can go with yeah. Nancy next. Okay, no problem. I'll see Good. you guys in a bit. Or you could just email, perhaps you could, well, it looks like Chris is going to you, because I was going to say, if you emailed the presentation to Chris, he might be able to yeah. share it then. Yeah, um, but we'll okay, to, sorry we, about that. Oh, that's, that's, yeah, that happens, so, but we'll go ahead with Nancy then, if that's okay with you, Nancy. Um, and Nancy, this will be the presentation from Nancy Jennings, and she has titled her paper, Mind the Gap, News for Youth in the U.S. Great, thank you so much. Um, so now I'm going to see if I have technical difficulties. Um, it seems to be. That was easy. To be. <laughs> okay, so I started the slideshow and I think it in the wrong place. So, Thera, do you see the slideshow? Yes, that's perfect. Wonderful. Thanks, Okay, um, so um, in a recent survey from Common Sense Media, it indicates that many US teens are reporting that they're learning media literacy skills at school that help them be critical consumers of information. And while media literacy skills are one way to enhance children's comprehension of news sources and information, an alternative would be to provide news sources that are specifically designed for children and teens with accurate and age appropriate language and content to help explain the world in which they live. In the US, previous news programs have been targeted um, to children, including things like Channel One, Teen Kids News, and Nick News with Linda Ellerby. Until 2016, Nick's, Nick News was the longest running news program for children and teens in the US, having been televised for 25 years. However, there remains a gap in regularly produced news targeted to children and youth in the US. And to fill this gap, Lester Holt started a news web, um, a news web-based program called NBC Nightly News Kids Edition in April of 2020. This news program is distributed where youth are, online through YouTube and through the NBC website. And it's also been broadcast in select markets as part of the educational and informational requirements of broadcast stations in the US. 
So this study offers some insight into what youth, young people think about news programs and their responses to news created for them. Online interviews were conducted with 15 US children um, aged nine to 12 um, in which children were asked about their news habits, followed by a viewing of five segments of Kids Edition. The segment, or, I'm sorry, the, the episode that was selected was uh, premiered on February 24th, and it contained five distinct segments that, and um, this episode, it also was, had a very high viewership, reaching over 300,000 views. It's one of the one, most watched episodes since the, whole, since the program started over two years ago. So before diving into children's responses to the episode, it was important to understand their news media use. Most of the children commonly reported using internet, TikTok, Snapchat, and YouTube shorts um, to learn about what was going on in their world. In fact, most said that they uh, did not watch news regularly online or on TV. Interestingly, of the 15 children interviewed, there was only one regular newser, uh, and he was an avid news user, listening to podcasts, watching CNN and Fox News, and following national public radio. When asked, almost all the children indicated that their parents did not have rules regarding watching or not watching news at home. So to follow these questions, I started asking them uh, whether or not they thought that news made for kids was important and, and would be of value to them. And overwhelmingly, they said yes. Their responses for why they um, felt that there should be news for kids um, fell into two primary categories. One, that there were limitations in the current news content. Um, the current news offerings uh, children said were too scary, contained inappropriate content, or were just too confusing. Um, on the other hand, children often al also expressed a desire to learn more about their world and thought that news for kids had the potential to offer that experience. Once the kids' news habits were discussed, the interview turned into viewing a viewing session of five different segments, and notable trends will be discussed. So first, the scary news. <laughs> um, two of the five segments contain news that would be considered frightening. These included a segment on the Russian-Ukraine conflict and on the current state of COVID-19. Most of the children reported that they believed the way the news on these two topics was covered was not scary. Moreover, most thought that the content was appropriate for children their age. And you can see here their, their different comments. They were, um, uh, they were concerned that children um, wouldn't watch the news otherwise, um, and that if you put it in the right wording, that uh, it was definitely appropriate for children. Another theme that emerged, again, was this age appropriateness. Um, and in some cases, the news was viewed as inappropriate for younger children. So here we have nine-year-olds saying, the news is great for me, but not for the six or seven-year-olds um, that might watch about the uh, news. Um, and on the other hand, some segments were identified as being too kiddy um, because they contained content for children that were younger. Um, and they thought that the content would be enjoyed by a younger crowd. Finally, um, an observation was made regarding a feature commonly used in children's media, including children as part of the segment themselves. In one segment, children recorded questions that were sent in to be answered as part of the news report. And in another case, a child conducted an interview with children with a children's television news or children's television producer, Chris Nee. In both cases, children indicated that they liked seeing other children in the news and that they did a good job asking questions that they had themselves. So through this process of cho showing children news made for them, new insights have been discovered about how children view their world and process news content. Research on children and news often focuses on the potential dangers of exposure to scenes from frightening events. And every time news breaks about a scary situation, we're flooded with strategies for ways to cope um, with the news, uh, with the adult news coverage. For heroes, look for the heroes, look for the helpers. Given what I've heard from these youth, I would argue that the heroes and helpers are sitting right here with us. The children's news producers who can share their these um, tragic and horrifying events in ways that inform but do not frighten, convey the magnitude of the situation without escalating panic, 
and put children at the center. So it's my hope that what I presented today can further inspire these producers to continue their work because as one of the children proclaimed, we need children's news. Wonderful presentation. Thank you so much, Nancy. Um, and I don't know if we're ready to go to Kim and Chris yet, um, or if we need to, if we should move on to the next presenter. So how are we doing over there? I think we're good. Let me just see here. You're good for Kim, Kim and uh, Chris? I think yes. so. Can you guys see? We can, we can see it. No, we wait, we it. can see. Yes, that's, that's your paper. Yes. Yeah. All right. So now that it's, yes. So I guess you can all see the title there. This is, I think it's going to be Kim that's presenting Becoming New Savvy Investigating Young Adults. Oh, right. <laughs> can you actually see the PowerPoint? You guys see the PowerPoint, Lynn? Yes, we can see it. Yep. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thanks, Chris. And you can hear me? We can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Here we go then. Okay. We will now move to a different age group, uh, which is the 18 to 24 year olds, which uh, we studied in our study in Denmark. Uh, my name is Kim Schroeder and uh, I'm uh, presenting on behalf of uh, the whole group of uh, Chris and, and our two PhD students. Uh, and as you can see, it's called Becoming New Savvy, Investigating Young Adults Information Repertoires from a Civic and Everyday Perspective. Um, as we all know, there is an impressive history of uh, academic interest in the role of news in young people's everyday life and why this role may change. And it's not only academics who are interested in understanding this, news organizations for obvious reasons are also interested in this topic. On this background, our paper offers a map of young people's news and, and, news and information repertoires uh, based on an integrated uh, qualitative quantitative method. In order to build new, uh, new understandings on news repertoires and how they change, our paper reports from an iterative study of young adolescents' information repertoires in Denmark. The study started with fieldwork in 2019 and uh, continued with an almost identical second stage in 2021 after the COVID uh, restrictions had been lifted. I had originally planned to say something also about our conceptual work on the notion of change, but due to the time constraints, I will skip that. Um, as I said, we use a method which is relatively innovative to audience uh, research uh, called Q methodology. Uh, we think this is an eminent method for discovering media repertoires and also an excellent heuristic for teasing out other aspects of how people navigate in the news landscape and why. Did you see me change the slide now? Yeah, okay, <laughs> I just wanna make sure. Okay. Um, we recently published an article uh, in digital journalism. That's why I'm showing you this uh, about the repertoires we discovered in the first piece of fieldwork. Um, and uh, I'll go on now to outline briefly our uh, fieldwork design. We had 24 participants um, aged 18 to 24. We used quota sampling, as you can see along those dimensions. The project was iterative, as I said, and we are interested also in going beyond media forms, news forms as we know, uh, as we know news. Uh, in that sense, um, we are adding sort of a, what you could call perhaps a finer granularity uh, to, the, uh, to the study that Sagit uh, uh, presented uh, before. Um, in this field work, we are particularly interested in getting the participants to talk about their current news and information practices and preferences also how they changed over time um, and what the drivers are that cause this kind of change. So our empirical emphasis has to do with mapping the current repertoires, but we also try to tease out the processual dimension uh, and to explore the various kinds of drivers behind these uh, changes. Here you can see how we implemented the Q methodology. I don't know if any of you are familiar with it, it's basically a card sorting approach um, combined with a semi-structured interview. Uh, we gave participants a set of 36 uh, cards with different information media types on them and asked them to sort these cards on a pyramid shaped grid. You cannot see the whole pyramid there, but it is a pyramid. Um, uh, in, and they were asked to place the media uh, they found important at the right side and less important media uh, on the left side. And they were asked to think aloud while they did that. 
Um, we reduced or merged many of the more adult news forms, television news, newspaper uh, types and so on, uh, so that we could also have cards with diverse social media and more than a handful of non-news media uh, like satire, TV series, influencers, memes, and so on. Um, in Q analysis, and sort, card sortings lend themselves to a quantitative translation into computable entities, which can then be subjected to factor analysis and resulting in a number of factors or repertoires. This is why I started describing this as a combined qualitative and quantitative uh, method. We found five such uh, repertoires among these young people. Uh, the slide shows for each repertoire, the five news media or information media, the top there repertoires. Uh, you can see how the first two repertoires, uh, the online traditionalist and the audio files use a fair amount of traditional legacy media interspersed with some algorithmic media, which are in blue, the legacy media are in red. Um, and I get, don't know if you can read this uh, quickly, but you can see the first one, for instance, news from Facebook dominates here, but there are then a number of legacy media, broadsheet, national newspapers, national TV, and local news. And then in between there's news from Instagram. Uh, strangely, uh, surprisingly uh, for us, there was a uh, uh, a repertoire which was very much characterized by different audio, radio genres. Um, but moving on to repertoires three and four, uh, the digital news seeker and the interpersonal networker, they are dominated by various types of blue algorithms, uh, algorithmic media interspersed with some green non-news media like TV series, satire and memes. Uh, and I'm now relying on you to be able to browse quickly through those lists, uh, moving on to the fifth repertoire, which is actually a non-news seeker who keeps informed about things important to them, not mainly through news media, but through, uh, yeah, non-news media. You can see those listed uh, there. Uh, in addition to producing this card sort for us, the young participants also produced verbal accounts of what media they use in everyday life. And you can have a look at the published article for details about this. In the second field work, briefly from 2021, we managed to get 15 of the original 24 participants, and we focused on what had happened to their repertoires since 2019. We asked participants to repeat the same card sort as in 2019, again accompanied by Think Aloud comments, and this produces a new so-called frozen moment in their news repertoire development. Um, and then we show them the 2019 version of their repertoire and invite them to comment on changes that may have occurred. Um, and uh, thereby we can bring um, sort of uh, changes that were beneath conscious awareness to the fore because they have to change right there before their eyes. And we then ask them to reflect also on the why, why these changes happened. And we probe systematically into what, what may have caused them, what drivers there were, and again, I think I'm running out of time, so I will not go into details, but you can see what those drivers, the, the, the main categories that those drivers uh, fall into. And we can get back to some of those perhaps if you are interested in uh, exploring that uh, more deeply. So I think I'll stop here and uh, thank you for your attention and bearing with me for the little difficulty. So thank you very much. Thank you, Kim, and thank you for keeping with us within some short time, and I, I'm happy that we'll be able to have some discussion time later, and this is really interesting work, and I appreciate that it's already been published, so we can look it up right. as well. And so now we're going to turn to a couple of our um, folks who are in the industry, so this is really nice to be able to have this conversation together. So our next presenter is Jan Willem Bult, from, uh, who is going to speak about Wadada News for Kids, and I don't know if you have a PowerPoint uh, Jan, and hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly, <laughs> but you're welcome to share the screen. So he's going to talk about the Without a News for Kids with Children at the Center. So thanks for being with us, Jan William. Yes, thank you very much. Um, well, I don't show slides. I have here my permanent picture of uh, Wadada here. Uh, actually, it's very interesting. If you look at this picture, this is the picture that speaks more than a thousand words. 
It is a, um, a reporter of the Wadada News, um, local news in Nicaragua, who went to the province where there is a garbage belt and he found a girl living there and interviewed her. That is also one of the powers of news for kids. It is a catalyst of children's rights. It is uh, a catalyst of um, integrating young people in um, on screen. And um, besides that, it's essential to have news uh, on the level of uh, different uh, ages. Uh, I'm always speaking about what other news is for children or for youth. You cannot make news for children and youth. You have to address them in a specific way. And uh, we're all working with children and youth. We know that um, how specific you are, the more clear and the more strong uh, messages can come through. Um, Yes, what other news? Where does it come from? Um, I'm working for a Dutch NGO that is called Free Press Unlimited. And Free Press Unlimited is taking care that press freedom around the world exists. Um, and if you translate that to what is the consequence of that for younger audiences, it means that we are developing uh, tailor-made news programs, news bulletins, news items for children or youth. This started already in 2004 under the then name Kids News Network, um, KNN. In the first 10 years, it was called like that. And in the first 10 years, the focus was on countries uh, in transition or development countries. Um, in 2014, uh, I joined uh, the NGO uh, uh, partly, and uh, they asked me to further develop it. And, my first suggestion was, why aren't we opening up for all the countries in the world? Of course, it will be hard to find fu uh, funding. I mean, not only for the development countries, but for any country. But why would we isolate it? What is, uh, why would we isolate it? So we decided also to change the name and the name became like, a, like um, uh, um, uh, any name that, that you, you start that, that you want to give a kind of special meaning, which is Wadada is a word that um, did not exist. And we used the word Wadada to, to make clear that we're talking about news either for children or for youth. Um, so since 2014, Wadada news further developed and uh, some, some 11 more countries, we managed to develop special news bulletins for children or youth uh, and uh, to further expand the network of cooperation because one of the strong parts of this what other news network is the exchange of materials. Um, so in a way we have a network of correspondence. In a way we are also promoting diversity. Um, so that is how during those years, the traditional television uh, um, uh, project Wadada was developed. But um, at the same time in 2014, we put the focus not only on the traditional media, but put the focus on the social media. And um, one of the projects lately that I'm very strongly uh, in development with is to make news in vertical video and to focus on, for instance, TikTok news. If you look, for instance, and that's why I'm very happy with this, this session where we talk about research, which is crucial for this area and is very under-researched over the last decades. So I'm very happy with this step forward. Um, but one of the things that uh, I uh, am being very interested in what's going on in TikTok, which connects millions of young people around the world, um, crossing all kinds of borders, is that uh, news basically was not existing there. And through the war in Ukraine, uh, it became a huge thing. For instance, a brand like BBC News was not existing in TikTok. During the war, they started to build their brand they still have only 50,000 followers. Uh, the reason is that they just take the news pieces that they make in horizontal format for television and cut it a little bit for um, to put it on TikTok. This is not how youth wants to consume and wants to participate in news. You really have to go out there and develop also vertical video skills. So, uh, I mean, we're in the middle of having this real new challenges that there are platforms that reach youth and children massively.
but where the development of language, the development of um, styles of news reporting is in a very early uh, early stage. So um, uh, that part is, is, has, has especially my interest, uh, uh, always working in, in, in innovation of media, uh, also myself as a film and, and television and interactivity maker. But um, uh, so one of the things I think uh, that has to change in the mindset of those people who take the decisions, let's say the 45 plus is that vertical video is a huge challenge, a huge new way of expressing news. Um, basically for interview, it's even much more interesting and much more strong to, sh to shoot it. Um, so in order to really connect with youth, with news, we have to be much more innovative and very fast. And um, uh, one of the things that you can do as, as a project that we're doing in Montenegro with the support of UNICEF there is to integrate youth reporters. So to train youth reporters in, in journalism and ethical of journalism, work together with journalists and produce new forms of news that reaches youth, that inform them and against them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jan Willem. And it's really inspiring to hear about Free Press Unlimited and the and the investment that's being made in this area. So I know we will have some more questions related to the work that you're well, doing. Well, just one thing to add to that. Uh, I'm really sad about the fact that it's getting more and more difficult to fund. I mean, in Europe, we have the luxury of having public, uh, independent public channels where there are some 10, 15 news programs dedicated for children. But in the rest of the world, it's very difficult. And uh, that is one of the things that uh, that is worrying me most, and their civil society has to play an important role. Absolutely, yeah. Thank you for that, and that's that's a really good transition, actually, to our our next presenter, um, and Toba Chapi, who is going to talk with us about uh, Busalala Media um, and a media literacy initiative. And his the title of his presentation is Youth News and Media Literacy in South Africa. So, Toba. Yes, uh, good afternoon, everyone from Johannesburg. Um, yes, uh, inspired by the presentations that I've heard uh, today, because um, um, a lot of it is, is also, you know, showcasing our experiences here in this part of the world, um, uh, particularly with, with the, the audiences and, and where um, young people or kids are getting their information from. Um, and uh, then the challenges of, of what it is that we need to do to get, you know, the information that they need to get without, for an example, scaring them off. Um, it's, it's, it's a big challenge, but uh, we have some experiences and, and, and some ways or approaches that um, we, we are trying here or that we've been working uh, towards here. Um, I, I don't necessarily have a presentation, but there is a video that I, I would like to show that is about three, three minutes, three and a half minutes long that speaks about an initiative or that shows an initiative that we have worked on recently. And I think that will highlight um, what also Jan Willem um, had mentioned here, the link of, of trying to include um, young people in the creation of news um, in, in, in a way that, you know, they, they understand because they, they, you know, they speak in a way that, uh, you know, other young people will, will understand. Um, and they, what the, the, the things that they will say, they will say at a level that will be taken in by a peer, um, which, which is important and which is something that we struggle with. And I just want to speak from an example of um, what is happening in, 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 in Europe right now um, with, with the war in Ukraine and, and, and a story that we would have to produce, for an example, for our television program. Um, the approach of having to go and say, okay, this is what's happening in, 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 in Eastern Europe right now. Um, you know, uh, we, we're hearing about the fake news that is happening in, 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 in Russia, and we're hearing about, you know, the, the war crimes that are happening in Ukraine, um, enforced by the, the Russian military and all of that. We, we can't necessarily um, get that information out there to a target audience of 12 to 14 year olds without scaring them. But it's information that they need to get. It's information that is important so that they can understand how the world works. So an approach that then works in this case would be like, okay, we understand that because of this war, there are repercussions that are affecting uh, our daily lives. So for an example, there are some, there would be some changes in the financial household at home. Um, mom and dad might not be affording certain things or certain things may be costing a bit more at home that were not, um, you know, three, four or five months ago. Uh, and then we would tell the story from this from this perspective that okay this is what is happening at at, at home the reason why uh, you know 
uh, we are not being able to 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 get um, you know more winter clothes right now because it's winter in the southern hemisphere. Um, is because uh, mommy has to focus more or daddy has to focus more on paying more for this, et cetera. And then we, we, we include that this is happening because uh, there is a conflict that is happening um, in this part of the world, which is an important um, you know, producer of this material or, or, or substance that is needed to keep things going at home. So you tell a story from that perspective to, to try and make sure that that information is, is coming through without scaring uh, children. But it's a big challenge here because we are not seeing that even in news programs for, for children um, here in, in, in South Africa, because the approach is still thinking that, okay, this is what we need to do um, to tell stories from kids uh, or, or tell um, or pass information or news um, to children. So what our program, what our initiative or our institution, uh, Vosalela Media is a mid uh, centered as, as a media literacy institution, but we also produce um, a news television channel called Bonaretsang. We have been working close with Free Press Unlimited for a very long time now. Um, uh, it's, it's, I think it's, 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 it's a decade now, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and we recently ran a, a, a media literacy program because that's one of, of our um, passions, um, which is not something that you are getting. I heard in Nancy's pr presentation that, you know, it's something that, that kids are getting in the classroom in, in the US. It's, it's certainly not happening here. Uh, media literacy is something that is, is, is a rare commodity in this part of the world, but we believe it's an important tool in helping um, kids to get into, um, you know, uh, learning how to produce news for themselves so that they their stories can then feature into the, the news program that, that we are producing. So we would do um, a three or four day media literacy training program to them introducing these skills because then, you know, you add objectivity into their worlds and those kind of basic tools. Um, you also help them when they are producing because then they produce these stories via their, their cell phone, so a smartphone. Um, because it's for television, they would record it in um, a landscape format. Um, Jan William also in, uh, raised an interesting, um, uh, you know, perspective on recording in in, in a portrait format um, for the different platforms. But in this case, because uh, we are working mostly for for television, they would then produce the, the content in in, in wide format, um, two and a half minutes long at least, and their stories would then be featured in, into the television program. Um, there's a section for that. Um, so we did a, a, a media literacy training course recently. That I'm going to show a video uh, with that. And, and what it was, it was about fake news. And when COVID started, um, there was a lot of fake news that was circulating just like here, just like in, in most, uh, most countries. And a lot of young people were afraid about what was going on. They were scared. Um, so one of the things that, that worked for us is, is to get it was to, to get young people to actually speak from this perspective, sharing stories about what was happening in their communities in, in a way of also educating and informing their peers about what to look out for uh, with, with COVID. So what we did is that we did the media literacy training with them. They went and then produced uh, the new stories and then the new stories would feature onto the television program. So. Um, I'm gonna share my screen and uh, so that you can see the, the video because I think it, it gives a good context to, to, to what our initiative is about. Um, I hope you can see my screen. I've also shared my computer sound as well. So here goes. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure if you can hear it because I can't hear it. No, we no. can't hear it. <clears throat> okay. Uh, so I think if you it. if you try sharing the screen again, do you have the option to uh, to click the box that says share sound? Yes, I had I had checked that. Yeah, I had okay. ticked on that option, share sound. Uh, we'll try again. Uh, for some reason, it's it's not going through because when when I escape. It plays, mm. so I've, I've stopped sharing now. Uh, We're probably taking up a lot of bandwidth, so it might be difficult to, if it's a streaming video. So yeah, so but maybe... it's already at, at full bling because now when I'm playing it, I can I can hear it, mm. but I'm not sure because I have the the check computer sound. Well, maybe if yeah, you, could, share some. you wanted to to uh, share some final thoughts about this, and then we can do uh, some conversation and perhaps try to come back to the video later if that's possible. 
But aren't there subtitles um, we can uh, read while it's playing? Um, no, unfortunately, there aren't any. Well, there are subtitles in the part that are, uh, are in are not in English, if I'm not mistaken. They uh, were. I think what what we just saw at the beginning of your video. Yes, this in in the beginning, and then there are parts that 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 is because uh, the videos that are produced by the kids have uh, subtitles, but then the other parts don't. Okay. Um, if if I can just try for one last time, check on all the other options. Okay. If if not, then I will just what I'm gonna do. I'm just I'm just gonna share the the link on on the chat option and then we could, can watch it separately. I have a problem in my community. Some of my community members are not there following the lockdown rules and regulations. They are always drinking as a crowd. As you can see for yourself, guys, there, these people are sharing one bottle of alcohol and they are not even considering how dangerous it is to share a bottle. Now, some people have said that drinking these three forms of liquids can help you. No, they are spreading fake news. The COVID-19 cases continue to rise drastically. Some people survive and sadly some die. This is because most of the people pay attention to the fake news like the not videos by the pool. In today's session of the Keeping It Real Session 1, we learned about the clickbait in which is a series of people posting something in a certain topic. Welcome everyone. Uh, we are running a media literacy training program. So I want us to look at how to identify if news is fake. Is this real or is this fake? COVID-19 is named so because it is the 19th Chinese originated viral infectious disease. That's fake. It's fake. Tell me why is it fake? Because I went to fact check to check if it's real or not. This is what would be a, a medium shot and this is what would be um, my long shot. Just make sure that you are showing a full frame, full body. The medium shot and the close shot, they look okay, but there's another important element that we look for in terms of when we are recording video space above the head. As you can see, in this shot and in this shot, there is no space above the head. This one from Sanele, let's see. Hello everyone, this is my favorite sister, sister in the world. Hello everyone, this is my favorite bed. Hello everyone, these are my shoes. Great attempt there by Sanele. We can see that the record and pause technique was used. Sanmonan, Sanmonan, Umar welcome to my humble abode. This here is my studio. I'm gonna give you guys a proper tour of it at some point. But today I wanted to talk to you about something that is really, really important. Now, I'm pretty sure every one of you guys is watching me on a phone, right? If you just not, this is all you need. This man taught me that this is one of the most powerful tools in the world today. With this tool, you can start fake news. And with this tool, you can end it. One thing is that I, I've, I've never imagined myself being a journalist, but now this program has made me to, to want more and to want to know more about being a journalist. Uh, I loved your video, like it was amazing, I enjoyed it. But the fact that you interviewed people that are not responsible or are, do not care about themselves and sharing the bottle which is not okay. Uh, I can't seem to have a problem with the video. My name is Mobile Nguenya. I'm from Pace Commercial Secondary School. I'm very happy and very glad that I, I won the prize. I want to start my journalism career next year. I want this to be my career. And thank you. Yes, um, so that then is basically us working with, with the young people to introduce them to um, uh, media literacy skills and then they have become a very integral part integral part of the program um, and we've done this training across the country uh, so we have a very you know a growing a very big network of, of these young people 
who uh, can play a role in producing and giving a, a perspective in, in news programs that can only be understood by, you know, their peers uh, in a tool that, that works for them. And they're sharing their community experiences and, 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 and that, that has worked a lot. But um, um, one, one other sp um, uh, important thing that Jan Willemann mentioned uh, is that there's, there's, a, there's a big challenge um, when it comes to, to support and, and, and funding for, for these kind of programs. Um, uh, the, the programs that work like this, are, well, the, the programs that are getting a lot of the support are the ones that are based on, on this research and, and what was presented here today, uh, prove not to be working. And, uh, but that's where, you know, the, the national broadcaster in South Africa still has a television program that is based on the old way of, or, or old traditional way of, of producing news, which um, is not working because you can see it on the social media pages that there, there is a very little reaction, particularly from the target audience. Um, so if the approach would change and, and, you know, more investment into the digital space, link the television program platform to the digital space, the two should not be separated um, and work with the different formats um, uh, and in the way that would be understood by the kids. And then you, you can make sure that you are getting content out there that is important, that they can understand in a way that works for them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matilda. Really an interesting project. Um, and we're fortunate now to have as a respondent, uh, Cynthia Carter, who has been writing in this area of children and news for, I think, maybe longer than anyone. So she's been working on this for 20 years uh, about this issue of young citizens and news and has also done some important research on the BBC and how young people received the BBC. So thank you for being with us as a respondent, Cindy, and we'll turn it over to you. Oh, thank you very much, Lynn. And um, it's been a really, really interesting session. So uh, thank you everyone for that. And, and just so much ground to cover. So I can't possibly do it all justice. So apologies in advance, but um, three uh, academic presentations to uh, its um, practitioner um, uh, uh, presentations lots of rich material there. But what I pulled out of it uh, were some certain kinds of themes that I think are really important going forward in terms of our research and engagement with young people. Um, and we saw that there were differences across age groups as well. So I think that's something to bear in mind um, in, as we go forward. But what strikes me is, is that at present, um, we've identified what young people are experiencing in terms of their news consumption. And that is a very fragmented experience where um, there's certain kinds of provision for them that adults think they know what children and young people want. So they just kind of throw things out there online, on television, here, there, and everywhere. So it, we need to kind of come to terms with how children and young people are actually experiencing the news, both adult news and news which is, is tailored specifically for them, and also the extent to which they're involved in those processes or not, as we've seen um, many of the, the um, presenters today talk about, um, you know, that relationship between the news audience and the news producers. Um, so fragmenta fragmentation of news experience. And um, we also see a really interesting thing, and I've seen this in, in my work and the work of others as well for um, some time now, and also including um, the Office of Communications in the UK who do research, they're the media regulator in the UK, they do research with children and young people, and they found that um, disconnect between what children and young people see as trustworthy but uh, as against to what they're actually engaging with. And I think that's a really important point that we need to continue to intervene in to try to make sense of. And, and clearly the work of everyone here today is, is trying to make sense of, of those issues. And particularly um, Kim and Chris's um, presentation on you know, how, how we get the, the fine grain of analysis to understand some of those uh, some of those issues that the need for uh, a range of methodologies and a range, looking at a re the whole context in which children and young people are using and consuming the news. Um, 
And it's interesting to note that actually television uh, across a, a couple of presentations still looms quite large in terms of uh, children and young people's engagement and sense of trustworthiness in the news. And it's one that often kind of drops off the agenda because it's not part of this snazzy new, you know, digital world. Um, and I know in the UK, we've, we've seen in the last couple of years, news round, um, the BBC's provision since 1972, gradually um, the television presence has uh, diminished as things move online. And currently we're talking about the extent to which that's a good thing or a bad thing or what that means exactly for ch um, children's engagement with the news. Um, another theme that came out here quite strongly across presentations was this turn to the audience, this importance of, of um, children and young people's um, voice uh, and the extent to which we're paying attention or not to what children and young people are telling us and what they're doing um, in terms of their news use. So a need for more finely grained analyses using a wide range of methods across time is, is obviously of central importance. Um, and this idea of repertoires I found very interesting as well in, in Kim and Chris's um, paper. Um, and that is, again, a finer grained analysis rather than simply talking about children and young people is, you know, what do you mean by that? Uh, what do you mean in terms of age, but also, um, you know, different kinds of use and not saying uh, all young people are using and consuming the news in this kind of way. Um, again, getting at the finer grain detail. Um, and another um, issue that came across, uh, came up across a couple of papers is this lack of targeted news for children and young people. And uh, probably particularly with the youngest audiences, this is most, um, most uh, important because that is where we've seen, for example, in the US context, um, a reduction in the amount of news provided for children. Uh, the same, a similar thing has happened in the UK. Um, uh, so it, that sort of thing really needs to be looked at in much more detail because children are, uh, you know, very, the youngest children are the ones who um, are la least best served. And if you're going to lay down um, engagement with the news, you have to do things like media literacy outreach. You need to in, engage children and young people in the news. Getting them involved as reporters is a great way to do it. And we've seen lots of kinds of um, examples of this. Um, Jan Willem's uh, research uh, and uh, you know, production with children and young people is, is one great example, as well as um, that of Matoba, who uh, took us through what is happening, um, at, what he's been engaged with in, in South Africa. Um, and so that brings me just to wrap up around the importance of in, engaging with young people, children and young people, of, of making sure that their voices are heard and that they're telling us, you know, what engages them, what doesn't engage them, why it's an issue of communication rights, of course. Um, and this has long been entrenched in the U, uh, UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, but more recently in a Statement 25 around children's digital communication, uh, digital rights, including uh, right to communication information and um, to have their opinions and voices taken seriously. Um, so yeah, why is this all important? Because it gets at the heart of the importance of news in terms of social cohesion and in terms of engagement, in terms of citizenship. And um, so we need to do all of these things and more, I think, in terms of our research and our production and our engagement with children and young people. Um, and the, the views and opinions and research that's been going on um, epitomized in this panel today is, I think, fantastic. And I'd just like to see more of it, please. 
Yes, thank you, Cindy. It was a really inspiring panel, I think, to be able to hear all of the different research. And um, and I, I want to make sure that we give an opportunity for the panelists to respond to uh, to Cindy's intervention. And um, I think one of the things that I'd like to hear about too um, is about any kind of intersections that you're seeing across industries, scholarship, and policymakers. Because as a person from the U.S., where there's very little appetite for policies that would support either media literacy or or production that is actually working specifically for young people. You know, we're, we're just very market driven and commercialized in the United States. So um, I think there's a tendency for those of us in the US to, to say, oh, things are so great in the Netherlands because they actually fund these kinds of things. But I'm interested in, in any kind of, um, you know, international comparative comments that you might have or any work that you're seeing in your areas that are trying to uh, foster this conversation between scholars and and industry and uh, schools and other policymakers. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to open that up to uh, to our panelists if they might respond to that and also respond to some of Cindy's interventions. Um, yes, Matova. Sorry, see your hand now. I, I, I can uh, just mention something which is uh, what I heard in or what I've observed, which is not happening um, here. Um, and that is like so much data um, that, that is being presented from, from research um, that can be useful to, to actually influence, uh, you know, policymakers to, to for particularly with, with our education in this country. To, to include um, a lot of uh, what is mentioned here as, as part of the, the school curriculums uh, and, and, and also you know um, with, with the communications department what to, to think about with, with you know uh, when you are creating and, and, and producing news and, and that kind of stuff for, for children in particular. Um, there is there's very little um, research you know that's going to say that okay this is what um, uh, children even want uh, to consume because the only thing that is um, spoken about at the moment is like you know uh, worry about your kids being on social media and 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 that and and what's happening at schools um and and you know the issues of bullying and and there's a lot of uh, trouble that you know we're seeing a lot of videos uh, not in inspiring videos coming out uh, from the schools because the kids are taking the videos to schools and those kind of things and the attention is heading towards that direction more but not much research is is being done here and i think that's that's where whether it's, it's 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 coming from the private sector, whether it's coming from 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 the state, um, it, it's certainly something that 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 is missing that could be helpful because without the data you can't really say that there's an issue or there's a problem to you know to be dealt with. But I, I found that to to be quite insightful and something that we, we can discuss with our team here as well. Mm, yes, thank you, Toba. And I'm wondering maybe if Kim and, and uh, Chris could comment on this in relation to the Danish context, if you've had some interest in the work that you've been doing among the Danish broadcasters and other organizations, if there's some work with policymakers and, and educators, since there's much more lively tradition, I think, where you are um, in media literacy. You want yeah. to have a go? Uh, sure. Come on, Chris. All right, well, I can say a just a couple of things from our experience. I would also say that there's a number of other colleagues in Denmark uh, from other universities who are far more on the younger children sort of, um, I think uh, Krista Christensen and, and also, um, oh, I'm forgetting her name in Aarhus. But we also have, I think what you pointed out, Lynn, uh, which I wanted to say is systems matter, um, which is weird. I'm an audience researcher, so I believe in sort of agency and experience, but I'm a sociologist at training. So I keep coming back to the structure and Denmark is as a Canadian living in Denmark, I'm struck by, even though we have a public broadcaster in Canada, just how strong uh, the system is in a welfare state with not only there being a public broadcaster, but also there being a, I guess we would, how would you translate a role, Kim? Uh, a ministerial a ministerial council basically on children, youth and media, um, which has academics and practitioners sitting on it and is, is actively funded and actively looking into media policy and things like that. And just to relate that to some of Kim and my experiences, we had one of the private uh, largest private um, news organizations reach out to us about a youth project that they were interested in some years ago. Um, and they were quite interested in, in our work and we were quite interested in collaborating with them. And, and there was a good uh, relationship. Kim had a good historical relationship. But at the end of the day, the profit motive means that all of our sort of good work kept sort of falling to the side because we tried to get this thing up and running. But at the end of the day, what they were really interested in is, of course, 
trying to figure out how to get more subscribers and sort of funding a research project. And they even have a fund, um, like a research fund to do. But even that sort of, it, was sort, it, it kept sort of, and they're busy. Um, and everyone's busy too. But again, when your busyness in a system is designed like it is on the council to part of your busyness is supposed to be working on media issues uh, for children, then your busyness fits quite nicely with the type of work we want to do. But when you try to have that same relationship with a, a national broadsheet or something, despite everyone's good intentions. So I, I think what I took, especially from the two practical um, presentations is, I mean, at the end of the day, funding is so unbelievably central to, to the ability of these sort of initiatives to work and to try things. And, and it is a, a case of, of experimentation because it is really hard to figure out what actually connects with what groups. And that's what we've noticed in our research is we have two relatively young PhDs and we were actually looking at relatively older youth, if you will, like 18 plus, and even our young PhDs in that small gap between like 18, 19 and 25, it was a totally different life world. Um, and even though they could remember their own, like so much had changed. So to say nothing of if you go down to seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. So I think there's so many challenges and the only way it sort of works in essence, I think to really advance these things is with strong systems. And unfortunately as academics, that's where we have the least power to control. Um, so I think that's that's actually the true challenge for this line of research. That would be my take as a Canadian uh, living in Denmark. Yes, thank you, Chris. I, I have definitely felt that way as well. And and Nancy, you know, one of the things that struck me about your presentation too is just that we had gone from this era of Nick News with Linda Ellerby, who was a really well-known journalist in the U.S., to now um, Lester Holt trying his hand at it. And so it's sort of like kind of taking some of the celebrity aspects of television news the way it's existed in the U.S. and then trying to leverage those as you know a way of again like raising money basically to try to make these kinds of things happen. Um, but it's also not something that's necessarily funded by a system. So, but I found, I found your research really fascinating too, Nancy, and I, you know, just in term, and it was actually making me think, it was making, reminding me of the power of channel one and wondering what's happened with channel one now, because I actually haven't been, of course, nobody's been in schools lately, but I just am curious if you could talk at all about what's going on with channel one, because they have had a really solid entry level point for those of you who are not familiar, you know, they actually have funded um, the equipment that allowed schools in the United States to have access to um, technologies. And then that's what actually also gave them an inroad to providing um, news stories within the school context. Um, but there was a, obviously a lot of debate about that with relation to, again, it being a commercial system and really having access to children as, um, as audiences for uh, commercial purposes. But do you know anything more about how, what's going on with Channel One, Nancy? So, so I was curious about that as well. So when, uh, when, this, when Lester Holtz uh, and NBC, the kids edition came out, I was like, well, what happened to Channel One? Um, and uh, Channel One has disappeared. <laughs> so, yeah, so it doesn't exist anymore. Um, so it's a, that's where I kept thinking about this this gap. Um, and then, uh, so Nick News um, has also uh, tried to come back as well, um, but they are also doing do, just it's not consistent. Um, so they're doing specials uh, like one hour specials, but um, but it's not that every day. Um, and even even the Lester Holt is like two times a week. So. Um, so it, it, I agree. Um, there, there are some concerns. There's no mandates in the U.S. for, um, for news for kids, um, and uh, I, I, I'm worried about that, um, particularly when um, you know, we've got such complicated issues, um, and that children are facing as well. Um, so. Yes, thank you. And I need to make sure we open it up for those who are have come to attend our panel. So if you have any particular questions, um, I want to see if you want to raise your hand and please jump into the conversation. Um, I also wanted to ask Sagid if you could talk a little bit about the Israeli context in this regard as well. Um, so if you're finding some, you know, since you went first, I'm not wondering now if you have some reflections on how your situation that you're seeing in the state of Israel is similar to or different from what you've heard in the other um, locations. Yes, so uh, I think that the main difference between Israel and the other countries is that in Israel there is a very high level of news consumption. News is very uh, attendable in our daily lives, but there are no news for kids, there are no news for uh, young people at all, and the main focus of the uh, policymakers and the educational uh, system is to um, 
it's for media literacy regarding uh, bully, um, like um, 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 net bully. Um, how do you say it? Um, yes, bully in the in in net media. I mean, bullying. Yeah. Social media bullying and uh, social media sex uh, or pornography um, um, content, but there is no media literacy regarding news. And uh, it makes me very unhappy because, you know, in Israel, we, we do need it. And uh, young people do need how to know to deal with news, I think. Um, so I hope that something will come up uh, for the Israeli uh, policymakers. Yes, thank you. And I was wondering also if Jan Willem, if you could comment on this, because I think one of the it is very useful for us to be able to hear about the amazing work that is being funded by your foundation. Um, but also, we, you know, I think one of the things just to echo what Chris had said earlier, we can't expect to rely on foundations to be the only source or even the primary source for uh, funding that's going to make it possible for us to have the societies that we want to, especially as things become so complicated with social media. And, you know, we've, uh, you know, I think Cindy mentioned, we've been relying, we've been talking quite a bit about television in some ways, because those are institutions that will deal with educators to some extent. Whereas, you know, when you're talking about ByteDance, which is the owner of TikTok, and you're talking about Google, and Facebook, they're they're definitely not in in they're even resisting the idea of seeing themselves as having a public responsibility. So I guess I'm curious about what you see for um, you know how how we can go forward. What kinds of things would be useful for you in terms of scholar from scholarly work, you know, to kind of help foster a conversation with policymakers to help foundations to be kind of a leverage point for conversing with national um, contexts. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, the, uh, the development of uh, Wadada News was uh, mainly funded by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in the Netherlands. Later, also the National Postcode Lottery, which is uh, one of the major funders of, let's say, good causes. Um, in, uh, but for instance, in Montenegro, um, we work with UNICEF and the National Regulator. And, I, and, and like in Europe, there is this, this strong position of public television where the public television has a budget and invested in, in serious things like News for Kids as well. I try to develop that in uh, Latin America, for instance, with um, what they call public television. But every four years after an election, all the people were fired and they have, we had to start all over again. That is not public television, that's state television. So I was very disappointed about that uh, there too. So I think basically, I think here's a huge chance for U United Nations, for U UNICEF uh, specifically, um, for UNESCO uh, to uh, step in to this um, area because like I said, it is a catalyst of children's rights. And um, uh, of course you need to have independent editorial uh, 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 editorial. Uh, uh, organizations to do it, um, but uh, supporting funding or s helping to raise the funds uh, through th those kind of organizations, I think there's a, there's absolutely a future. For yes, thank you. And we're just about out of time, but Maria Jose. Besides has that, um, in okay. Tunisia, for instance. All right. <laughs> I'm sorry, I wanted to make sure that we gave Maria Jose a chance to uh, raise her question, so she has her hand up too. Okay, so good morning everyone. Uh, sorry I couldn't listen to everything so well because it was really noisy here. Uh, and thank you so much for this really interesting panel. And um, just uh, um, one or two comments. First, I'm really happy to see that uh, the field is um, is uh, really alive uh, with this panel and yesterday with the pre-conference uh, on youth and news. So um, uh, I'm really very happy with that. And um, just some few comments, uh, things that um, we are also dealing with uh, in regard to to the project that uh, we are doing and that is starting now. Um, this idea that uh, we are using uh, or um, young people are using the new, but saying they trust in, in the old uh, media 
Um, so uh, this is uh, actually Cindy also uh, mentioned this this uh, dimension. Um, this idea that, that we need to go beyond news, as we know, uh, but still, if we are talking about this, is also because news are important from the democratic point of view. Uh, and uh, specifically um, to Kim uh, and uh, Chris, um, so I, I was uh, here, um, the, your research is really interesting, and I was here thinking about um, uh, two things. Uh, one is that in the repertoires, uh, and at least uh, in the most prominent part of the uh, of the factor analysis, uh, we don't see anymore in the in the, uh, the the names of the repertoires. We don't see uh, the traditional uh, media. Uh, and um, in regard, maybe sorry because it's really noisy here. Uh, in regards to uh, news avoidance. Uh, that is something that we can also have the sense in some of the repertoires and specifically in the fifth. Um, so I don't know if you can talk a bit more about this uh, avoidance that is always in a way uh, coming back when we are talking about news consumption. Kim, do you want this one? Or yeah, <clears throat> well, well, uh, thank you, Maria. Um, yeah, you're you're right. I mean, um, the <laughs> the closest we get to news avoidance in in our repertoire uh, system is really the last category, who are non-news users, because they seem to be not using news. In in all the other repertoires, there's some trace of, uh, of, of what we see as, uh, as, as traditional news, uh, but we didn't focus on, on, on that particular aspect. We, we did talk to people who were sort of information hungry, um, whether for news media or other uh, sources. So uh, I think we will have to leave that to you and other people to go more into the uh, the details of the uh, of, of the news uh, avoidance and the disconnection from news and and the public world and so on. And just one thing to add, we haven't sort of got, but if I'm right, Kim, remind me. But from the second set of field work, um, I mean, one of the issues with the idea of news avoidance is sometimes that it's sort of posited with this normative sense that it's illogical. Um, and what we found, which parallels some of the other. COVID studies that have come out, it was, it was perfectly reasonable and healthy to start like and a perfectly rational, normal, emotionally stabilizing thing to have to, to have gotten fatigued with COVID news, which happened sort of because we did our follow up and we had to cancel it three times with our people. That's why we only ended up with 15. Eventually, we lost them sort of with each successive cancellation, but it's, it's a perfectly reasonable. So, I mean, again, I think there's there's some uh, normatively loaded assumptions in news avoidance that I think, um, which also I think the practitioners pointed to, like news avoidance can also be this just is really unpleasantly packaged. Like, why would I want to watch this? It's it's boring. Um, that's that's a perfectly, we could call that news avoidance, but it seems quite reasonable to me. Or if you look at studies other people have done about uh, marginalized youth in France and stuff who don't like to watch news because how their group and their area is portrayed is, is on a, that's also seems like a very reasonable stance and then quite a logical and, and critically interesting stance. So I think there's some, some nuancing of the term news avoidance that I think I would want to sort of look into um, that goes beyond just even what people choose, but the rationales behind why they choose them. Um, and lots of other colleagues have done far better work uh, on that, frankly, than, than us. Um, but we cite them. So, <laughs> um, so that would be the thing to say. Um, oh, yeah, speaking of which, there actually is at two o'clock a COVID thing coming up and I have to run from my hotel.
Yes, I know we need to wrap this up. So, and thank you so much to everybody. And thanks, especially again to Nancy Jennings for putting this panel together. And, and it's, there's so much more that we could say. I think we all want to, it would be really nice to just stay on this call for a while and continue to talk. So I think we need to figure out some other ways to continue the conversation. So whether that means another um, ICA pre-conference or, you know, we're, we are talking about having a special issue at least that would be devoted to youth and news within journalism studies. So I'll send you all some information about that. Um, but I also want to say a special thanks to Mtoba and Jan Willem for joining us and for the work that you're doing. Uh, we know that it's challenging and it's also rewarding and so we really appreciate especially that you're out there testing these things out and, and helping to demonstrate how important this work is. So thanks to everybody for a panel for this a really worthwhile panel and hope to see some of you in Paris in, in the next couple of hours or days and others of you perhaps next time around. So thank you again. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Very interesting.